Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm Susan Labondabar. I'm from Swing Left Greater Boston, Swing Blue Alliance. And welcome to the third in the Election 2020 Traveler's Tales series. I'd like to thank, before we get started, the groups from the Grassroots Fundraising Network who co-sponsored this event. All of these groups are non-professional fundraising groups who raise money for candidates and for progressive groups on the ground in swing states. Here are the groups that co-sponsored the event. Brooklyn 50 from Brooklyn, New York. Crimson Goes Blue from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Candidates and Causes, also from Cambridge. East Bay Activist Alliance from San Francisco, California. Neighbors Defending Democracy from Washington, DC. Red to Blue from Brooklyn, Ma Brooklyn, New York. Silver Spring Progressive Action from Silver Spring, Maryland. Swing Left North Shore Cape Ann from Swampscott, Massachusetts. The Wellesley Democratic Town Committee from Wellesley, Massachusetts. Wynn, Wisconsin from Madison, Wisconsin. And Women Engage from Newton, Massachusetts. I'd also like to thank the incredible team that put this event together. And they include Rachel Wexler, Sanford Lewis, Paula Joseph, and Paul Dingus. Paul is the technical director of Blue Bonnet Data, a 501c3 nonprofit that trains the next generation of data geeks for the future of the progressive movement. Along with Becca Blaise, Blue Bonnet Executive Director, Paul will be facilitating this event. But before I turn the show over to Paul, a few quick technical details. There are a lot of people on this call. Please remain on mute throughout the event and put your questions in the chat box. Also, to get the best experience, put Zoom on speaker view. You can do that by clicking the view button at the top right corner of your screen. Thank you and take it away, Paul. All right, thank you so much, Susan. And thank you for helping us put on this incredible event. It is absolutely wonderful to see everybody uh, in the audience. And I'm really excited for what we have to share with you today. Um, as Susan mentioned, I'm the technical director at Blue Bonnet Data. And one thing that we all know is that grassroots politics is all about building connections and building relationships across the country. What Blue Bonnet does is we build connections between people with great technical and data skills and the down ballot campaigns that need help um, putting up a fight in their district. And today I'm really excited to say that we have two amazing stories from two 2020 campaigns, both state senate campaigns both successful one from maine and one from minnesota so uh, you're going to be hearing from both of these campaigns from some of the campaign staff and candidates um, as well as some of the blue bonnet fellows themselves who contributed uh, and put in a lot of hard work towards supporting these candidates and allowing them to be uh, ultimately prevail um, in in what might seem somewhat tough districts so uh, another note really quickly, we are going to cover both campaigns, um, but then there will be a Q&A section at the end. So that's gonna start around 7.45. We will take the last 15 minutes for Q&A. Uh, I hope there's many curious listeners. Um, but without further ado, I am going to go ahead and introduce our first uh, team that is gonna share a little bit about their experience with you. We have um, with us today some of the members of the Chloe Maxman campaign for uh, Maine State Senate. Uh, we have Canyon Woodward, the campaign manager. We have Nick Link and Miranda Miao, uh, two of the Blue Bonnet fellows that worked with the campaign and supported them uh, through, their, through their data and technical efforts. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Canyon uh, to go ahead and introduce the setting, tell a little bit about the, the campaign, uh, and then uh, we will get into some of the, uh, the ways that Blue Bonnet was able to support them. Hey everyone, so stoked to be here with folks tonight. Thank you all for tuning in. Um, I'm just gonna go over a little bit of the background of the district that we were in up in Maine and talk a little bit about Chloe, the candidate. Um, so she, um, she grew up in super rural, super rural Maine. So the district that she was running for for state Senate in 2020 is in Lincoln County, which 
is 100% rural. Um, so it's, it's tied with one other county is the most rural county in the most rural state in the country. Um, not exactly a democratic stronghold. And um, it is a county that went for Obama in 2008 and 2012, and then it swung for Trump in 2016. So, so it's a pivot county. And um, she was challenging Dana Dow, who was the Republican leader in the main state Senate. So the most powerful Republican in the state, state government. Um, neither side had succeeded in unseating a, a party leader dating back to 1992, the year that Chloe was born. Um, and Dana Dow, Dana Dow is just a huge business icon in, in the county and he had never lo lost a general election um, since he was first elected to the Senate in 2004. And so in comes Chloe, um, who had been elected to the state house in 2018 um, and served as the, the youngest woman in the state house. Um, spoiler alert, she's, she's now the youngest woman senator in Maine's history. Um, and she was an elected to the state house in um, 2018, overcoming a negative 16 point Democratic advantage. So Republicans had won that district by 16 points on average over the past three elections. So she was used to some uphill battles. Um, she was super successful in her first term as a freshman legislator. She passed the Green New Deal for Maine um, and, and several other bills. And she was named the legislator of the year in 2020 by the Maine Council on Aging, which is pretty cool for the youngest person um, in, the, in the legislature. And yeah, like I said, she grew up in super, the super rural community on her family farm. Um, and she co-founded the cam campaign to get Harvard to divest from fossil fuel companies in college, which is how I met her. Um, we co-coordinated that together became best friends doing climate organizing. And then the day she graduated, she loaded everything up into her dad's pickup truck and moved back to Maine because um, that's, that's her place. Um, and she's, yeah, she's the recipient of the Gloria Barron Prize for Young Heroes, the Brower Youth Award. Um, her, her environmental work in high school was a focus feature on a Sundance Channel documentary series. She was named a green hero by Rolling Stone. And, um, you know, basically not exactly what you would expect as your, your model candidate for, for a pretty moderate conservative rural district, um, kind of in the heart of Maine. Um, and so, yeah, after her first term, she was, she was recruited to take on this this Republican leader and we launched our campaign with a big community potluck um, in the middle of January, cramming over a hundred of pe hundred people in this tiny tiny room to to launch the campaign. And then, you know, very quickly, everything changed. All the visions we had for uh, repeating this huge grassroots campaign of of 2018 kind of felt like they went out the window as, as COVID struck and we put, you know, put all of our campaigning on hold and um, tried to figure out what to do. And a couple of days passed and we realized that we already had this huge network of volunteers all across the district. And so, um, and so we started a mutual aid effort um, out of that, out of that campaign network to initially just start calling seniors. Our, our first phone bank that we organized, we called every senior in the county who, based on voter records, it, appear, it appeared was living alone to check in with them and assess needs. And then over time, we were able to expand that to, to call everyone over 60 in the district to check in with them, see what their needs were, connect them to food banks and other resources, get groceries delivered, um, 
just provide social support and someone to talk to if they needed um, and stuff like that. And that was a, a big area where Blue Bonnet came in along with helping us um, pull up historical data to kind of dig into that pivot county shift of voting for Obama twice and then shifting to Trump to see where those margins were, where, where folks were, were shifting. So um, I'll turn it over to a couple of our Blue Bonnet volunteer rock stars who, who helped us through, through thick and thin, Nick and Miranda to, to go into more of that. Yeah, thanks, Canyon. Um, yeah, as you can tell, Canyon and Chloe were pretty awesome to work with. So we were, we were lucky on the Blue Bonnet side. Um, and I'm gonna talk a bit about the COVID work that was done because I thought that was a really exciting part of the campaign. Um, I guess not really part of the campaign, but just providing support to the community. And um, how we helped out a little bit on that side is that uh, uh, the Blue Bonnet team helped organize a uh, directory and map of resources that were important to people in the district. So like COVID testing sites, um, food bank sites, grocery stores and their um, elderly hours that because they were changing. Um, and this is a list of resources that could be used by people in the district, but it was actually uh, more frequently used by volunteers on these calls. Um, right when they would call someone and see if they needed support for something, and they'd often just you know ask like, uh, where is the, the nearest grocery store that has elder, can, elderly hours or you know, the nearest testing site and, and volunteers would be able to share that. And so it was exciting we were able to contribute on that side. And then the, um, the next thing we did was that at the end, since they had so many volunteers putting in all this work, um, we helped create these uh, automated you know, reward sheets for each person. So they're individualized based off of how many people that uh, each of the volunteers called and talked to uh, and gave back some of the information. You're seeing a picture there. It's uh, might not be able to see all the specifics, but um, this just, it helped tell the story of um, how each volunteer fit into the, you know, the, the bigger support um, of everyone in help, helping the, the whole district. Um, and, and for me, like that, I thought this was the coolest part of, of the work that we've done because uh, this is like, to, to me, this is what local politics is supposed to be about. Uh, it's like using our collective power and resources to, to really help support the community um, rather through the COVID crisis or whatever else. And I, I guess this is my first time really being involved in an effort like that. And I, it was really uh, motivating for me um, to, to be involved in that. It, was, it made me motivated to stay involved in local politics and want to work on campaigns more like this. Um, Miranda, I'll let you uh, talk a little bit about what we did on the data side for the past elections, and then also the, the surveys. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Nick. Um, I did have to say those waffle plots in the um, volunteer sheets are my favorite part of the campaign. They're really, really nice to make. Um, but yeah, in terms of the data, we uh, we played a role in basically analyzing all the historical data for all districts for presidential, governor, and all state elections. Um, I think that went all the way to 2000 or even a bit earlier. And we cleaned that data up and we were able to um, basically plot a time series data set to analyze each individual district, see how their voting behavior evolved over time. Um, and the other key um, metric we did to understand how each district are behaving is basically uh, looking at the number of flips that they have experienced in the past. So let's say Jefferson district is a swing district, but we want to like measure the elasticity of their willing behavior compared to other districts. Um, therefore, we took the measure um, of the number of times this, this uh, district flipped from one party to the other uh, historically to basically measure how um, possible it is for this place to flip again in our election, even though they will be before um, for Benadale. Um, so that's one key measure we did, which was really helpful in terms of like um, uh, just targeting the places that we should go because we all have time and resource constraints when it comes to like employing um, time and energy. Um, and the other thing that I think was really interesting was to just like plot out all the data 
points for all the districts um, and see how the women behaviors evolve over time. Um, if, if one district has been experienced a very, very uh, large margin, um, as I, I see a question here, I'll answer that question shortly. Um, if one district is uh, having a very large margin uh, in terms of uh, voting for uh, Republicans, but that margin has been going down, even though there isn't like a very large number of flips, we should still target that district. So that was really helpful as well. Um, and for um, software, we used R to program uh, most of our plots and data and just to clean. I think our original data was from Excel, however, if Nick can talk about that. Um, I think there was some difficulty with the importing initially, I'm not sure. Yeah, there was. And I, I think, Miranda, just to summarize what I found surprising with uh, what we did in the past data is that um, coming in, I assume that, because I think in most places in the country, there's pretty consistent voting and percentage of uh, you know, Republican, Democrat, independent. Um, but I think what was surprising me looking at this district um, was seeing how much the uh, voting changed from election to election and how much we saw this also in the surveys that um, the campaign was doing when they're, they're surveying how likely someone was to vote, Democrat or Republican, just seeing how much that even swung, you know, in the last two to four years. Um, which, which was cool to see and cool to see that there was that room for, you know, for flipping back and forth. And that, that means that that's why you can have a candidate like Chloe who did, you know, such amazing campaigning can swing a lot of people to um, vote a lot for the, for the Democrat. So I wanna pop in here and prompt, I guess, uh, Kenyon, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what the you know, main takeaways for you are from this experience, from working with Chloe um, in these rural districts, and then the Blue Bonnet team, kind of what y'all learned that you may not have known before working with a campaign like like the Maxman campaign. Um, my, my Wi-Fi broke up a little bit, but I think I got most of that, but hop in if, if there's, sounds like there's a hole in my answer. Um, I think for me, being in the extremely polarized political climate that we're in, um, one of the biggest takeaways for me was how impactful face-to-face -face connections can still be, um, and how much how much common ground can still be found if you're if you're willing to stay in the conversation with somebody past you know past the point of of maybe getting tripped up on hearing some things that, that, that you really don't agree with. Um, and just, yeah, being there and talking to folks who you don't, don't agree with on everything and searching for that common ground is so powerful, especially when in, in such a digital age and, and through COVID when so, much, so many of us were, were so isolated um having those human connections is really powerful and and i think also in addition to that um folks especially in rural areas you know I, certainly certainly everywhere but i think especially in rural areas folks really don't feel connected to the political system they feel really frustrated with washington um and, and with their state State leadership and they don't feel yeah they don't feel heard and they're pissed off and pretty rightly so and so especially that like, did it show up at your and you willing to listen to you directly um that's really powerful for people and, and transformational and um yeah that was one of the biggest take takeaways for me face-to-face -face conversations grassroots organizing um, is still one of the most powerful things that we can do. Yeah, I'll follow up and just say I was amazed at how much face-to-face -face canvassing is you're able to be is able to be done during a campaign if you have the energy for it. I mean, I didn't 
I didn't think they would be able to, you know, before doing this campaign, be able to like go house to house to as many houses as they did, or basically call everyone in the district. Um, but just if you have the energy and the time, I mean, you can do that. You can reach out to everyone, at least in a district this size. So, that was cool to see. Yeah, um, I guess to add to that, for me, I personally love math and I love statistics and like just being able to use that to a campaign is really powerful for me personally. But um, even though we were able to um, pinpoint the district that are our flip um, districts, but sometimes it's really hard for us to turn that around, right? Like how do you turn it around? Even though we found that key, um, key hole in our campaign, how do we do this? So I think Chloe's campaign um, theme, which is community, is such a strong message because it's so universal and it's so powerful when it comes to bring people together. Um, so that was definitely really um, inspiring for me personally. Thank you guys so much for sharing. I Yeah, really appreciate it. Uh, Candy, I'm also just wondering any final thoughts on the, uh, you know, the work that the Blue Bonnet Fellows did and sort of what it allowed the campaign um, in terms of in terms of insights or supporting the activities. Yeah, I think I think one of the one of the biggest things was just really digging into that historical data down to the level of every single precinct and visualizing that for us going back um, all the way to I think was it 2008 y'all um, that was that was really helpful for being able to to hone in on on where to especially prioritize our canvassing efforts um, and to su supplement the other the other voter data that we had through um, you know the DNC's modeling and and other sources. Um, yeah. yeah, from my understanding of looking through some of this, it's it also showed that, like, like what you were alluding to, Canyon, that these voters swing a lot from election to election. Right? There's a lot. Of, there's a lot more room than you might assume to you know walk up to somebody's door and have a conversation with them, and actually, you know, actually affect the decision that they'll make when they come to the ballot box. Totally. the The number of folks with signs in their yard for for Trump and for Chloe it was mind boggling you, you know you, you shake your head and 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 just amusement but um, yeah it just goes to show that that personal connections can can overcome that yeah perfect um, I am gonna go ahead and uh, let's transition over to our next uh, campaign guests. So again, thank you all from the Maxman campaign. Again, that's Kenyon Woodward, uh, the campaign manager, uh, Nick Link and Miranda Miao, uh, Blue Bonnet volunteers that were working with the campaign to support them on the data side. Um, now I want to turn to the second of two state Senate campaigns, a really wonderful campaign that was run in the St. Cloud area of Minnesota. Uh, and with us today, we are lucky enough to have Senator Eric Putnam, uh, who evidently was successful uh, at winning the election. And um, <clears throat> we have Bree Sharkey-Smith, uh, the illustrious campaign manager, as well as um, a couple of Blue Bonnet volunteers. Uh, once they uh, pop up here, you'll notice that they actually have the same last name because Shay and Aiden are actually two brothers uh, who joined up with Blue Bonnet, formed a team together, and started working uh, to to remotely support the efforts um, of of uh, Senator Putnam and um, his campaign. And uh, just like last time, I, I think it's best if I just hand it off um, to you to sort of set the scene and discuss, you know, what was done and how the how the team was able to contribute. Sure. Well, uh, thanks, Paul. Thanks for having us here. Uh, well, first of all, thanks for working with us. And thanks, you guys, for hosting this uh, this session, because it's a great opportunity for me to see my BFF, Bree, and my new pals, uh, uh, Aiden and Shay, again, uh, which is always great to see them. So here's the thing. I do want to, to quibble with you just a little bit in terms of how this thing is framed, because you're talking about forgotten districts. And so I have to I have a little bit of beef with that, because our area is not forgotten. In fact, 
St. Cloud appears in the New York Times quite regularly, usually in a sentence that uses the word racist, uh, but it's there. So we were not forgotten. So what I like to do is I'm gonna tell you guys a little bit about St. Cloud. Um, I, I actually love the place. I'm not from here originally, but there's lots of stuff for us to talk about. I'll talk a little bit about St. Cloud and then a little bit about our candidacy. Uh, and then just have a, a conversation with uh, uh, Aiden and Shay and Bree and talk to you guys a little bit about some of the stuff that we did and how we think it worked. So uh, St. Cloud is in central Minnesota. Uh, we're about an hour west, northwest of St. Paul and uh, Minneapolis, but that's a huge distance. St. Uh, Cloud has traditionally been pretty conservative in lots of different ways. Um, in the late 70s, early 80s, it was often represented by a Democrat, but usually a very sort of strong kind of labor sort of Democrat. Um, the town has traditionally been fairly racially and culturally homogenous. Lots of, sort of German Catholics, uh, Eastern European Catholics is the kind of stock that most people uh, uh, kind of consider themselves coming from on St. Cloud. And, and the district itself is fascinating too. So you've got St. Cloud, which we got about 65,000, 70,000 people. And then you've got uh, Wake Park, which is uh, another town that's attached to us, which is really just a series of Chili's and Applebee's. Uh, and then you've got uh, some rural areas that are also attached to our district, two um, uh, uh, townships, and then a town called St. Augusta. So the district's been gerrymandered in such a way, so as no matter how progressive, whatever that word means, St. Cloud itself might get, it's got this anchor of very rural, rural populations all around it. Um, about uh, 10 years ago, about uh, uh, 10, 12 years ago, our school district was probably 95% white. Uh, this year, it's 55% people of color. Think of how profound a change that's having on our, our community. And that change is largely from East African populations who are moving to St. Cloud uh, in several different waves of immigration. So about 10 years ago, we a, lot of folk, a lot of folks who came from Kenya. A couple years ago, a lot of folks came from Ethiopia. It's really, really culturally mixed uh, at this point. And that also manifests in some really interesting politics because like I was just saying, we've got these kind of rural uh, Catholic kind of areas and then this sort of urban core that's growing up uh, in its own way. Um, that it doesn't always play nice with the other areas. Um, and I've said this before, and people make fun of me for it, but I genuinely, genuinely believe it, that I think St. Cloud is more like America than the rest of Minnesota and maybe the rest of the Midwest. Because not just in terms of demographics, although there's that, also because we are actively, thoughtfully figuring out who we are. We are consciously engaged in self-reflection with some sense of uh, ambition toward the future. To me, that's what characterizes St. Cloud, and I think it's really true. Now, in terms of uh, uh, prior elections, um, I ran for the House, uh, Minnesota House on the 14A side, which is the considerably more conservative side. I had no interest in electoral politics at all whatsoever. Uh, Chloe was a rock star. I had no business running for office in that area. I'm a college professor from San Francisco and I have tattoos all over me. I have no business running for office in rural central Minnesota, let alone representing the place, um, but I did. Uh, because of some of the concerns I had with some of the people who were in office there. And so we ran for house in 2016 and again in 2018. Uh, and in 2018, um, I was told uh, several months before the election by people in St. Paul uh, and people in the party that all we had to do was get to 46% and you would be a shoe in if we ran for Senate in 2020. The logic being that the 14A side of the district is, um, you know, considerably more Republican and the 14B side is a little bit more democratic. So you put the two together, all I got to do is get to around 46% and we'd be fine. And in 2018, we got to 48%, um, which put us, we thought, in a pretty good position for actually running for the Senate. And so uh, that's what we decided to do. One other interesting variable is that um, my opponent was elected in 2016 by 134 votes out of 40,000 cast. It was a very, very close election. Uh, in uh, 2016. Um, uh, we are similar to the district in Maine, uh, a district that went for Trump, uh, went for Obama, bar just barely, barely Obama, then Trump. Uh, and um, in 2020, uh, St. Cloud itself actually went for Biden, but the rest of the area was still very, very pro-Trump. So to me, it's an incredibly complex and interesting place. And I'm incredibly grateful to have these three wonderful human beings to work with us together to actually um, make an impact there. So Maybe we could start talking a little bit about some of the things we did. Is that okay? Is that good for you guys? Yeah. So I was thinking a little bit about some of the things we did. And um, 
in my mind, the work that we did together fell in sort of two different buckets. One being the understand the district bucket and the other build better relationships within the district bucket. So like in understanding the district better, you guys made some really cool maps. That was my joy. It, you made awesome maps. Uh, do you, uh, and then we, and then secondly, after we talk about maps for a little bit, and that kind of stuff, maybe we could talk a little bit about some of the stuff that helped build relationships, like some of the targeted lists that you guys built, uh, and some of the language work in particular, which is also pretty great. So let's talk maps. What do you guys got? Yeah. Um, so it actually just popped up on the screen there, but I think um, to kind of start, we we were attracted to this race um, for a lot of the reasons that, that Eric just talking about. Like this is a really a rapidly evolving district and obviously being so closely contested the election before and having, you know, sat down with Eric and Bree just once we, Shay and I knew and our teammates, Aditi and David and uh, Thomas who couldn't be here tonight, um, all knew that like this was gonna be a lot of fun. So this is gonna be great people to work with but also just a really interesting challenge. Um, and so a lot of what we did, like Eric was saying was really try to help them understand the district, but this is also very educational for us because we're all from around the country. Uh, I'm in New York, Shay's in Boston. Aditi was in LA for a time. Um, and none of us had ever been to St. Cloud. I, we still haven't, um, but we really needed to kind of quickly learn about like what we were dealing with here. And so in order to help Eric and Bree do that as well as ourselves, I set about kind of creating these maps showing census data over the community to try and understand for ourselves sort of the history of the community, but also where there were kind of overlapping issue areas. Um, so understanding things how uh, like immigration status and economic distress might intersect or where there might be large student populations that are also you know, potentially unemployed or again, kind of facing housing distress or things like that. And so that was kind of our first project was just to one for ourselves and one for Eric and Bree because they already knew a lot of this kind of intuitively from having run twice already. Um, but to kind of just understand it in a more fine grained way. And then a lot of our other work in sort of understanding the district kind of fell again along those economic lines. And that was a lot of Shay's work if you wanna speak about that brother. Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, in that bucket of understanding the district, I'd say the main other thing was kind of a trend analysis, which we can see in some of these charts here. And this was both, you know, informational for us, like, you know, where geographically in the district are there or small businesses? What size are these small businesses? Uh, how do these businesses break down in terms of sector uh, retail versus food services is what we're looking at here. And then we wanted to understand like the trend of certain economic sectors in the district, which is what you see in this third chart. So we can see that um, manufacturing suffered more in St. Cloud than the nation as a whole. And so, you know, this was informative for us as a team and for the campaign, but it also informed um, the arguments, um, you know, as we went into forum season and debate season to really have numbers and visuals uh, to back up this information. And I see the question in the chat, how did we choose which topics to analyze? And we, we took our marching orders from Eric and Bree. Um, so we just wanted to put our, our technical skills at their disposal and dig into whatever they felt was most interesting based on their intuitive knowledge of, you know, what was going on on the ground. Absolutely. And I think a lot of this also kind of intersected. Again, we, we joined the campaign in May, so it was still very early in the pandemic. So a lot of this was also related to trying to understand, again, and sort of understanding the district, but also trying to figure out, you know, what the messaging would be and, and how we would communicate with the community or how Eric and Bree, because Shay and I didn't really do a lot of direct communication, uh, but we communicate with the, with the wider St. Cloud community about, you know, what issues they might be facing due to COVID or like Shay just showed due to general decline or general consolidation of different industries in the area compared to the rest of the state. Um, but yeah, then I guess the kind of second second bucket there is where a lot of the work actually ended up following and a lot of it is not very visually pleasing as the, as the maps, but was honestly incredibly critical. I, I don't know, Bree and Eric, if you wanna talk a little bit more about exactly what that kind of uh, work kind of meant for you guys. Yeah, so if we look back at, um, yeah, we can look at this. So I, I see we've got yard sign mapping up right now. And this was one of those projects that really um, 
it helped us figure out how to spend our time most efficiently. So, you know, with all campaigns, you've got, uh, they're all run on time, people, and money. Those are the finite resources. You can break them up any way you want, but that's what you're working with. And you only have so much time. The calendar is what it is. Um, you can always get more people. If you've got a great candidate and you've got some great messages, you can always find more volunteers. Um, and then you run into money constraints because in Minnesota, we have campaign finance laws and we're only allowed to spend X number of dollars. Uh, so given that we had finite time, tools like this um, with the sign mapping, the yard sign mapping thing that we've got here, uh, you guys can talk a bit about like how you created the map but my and, and what data it contained. But my um, memory from <laughs> so long ago uh, was that it was a list of all the strong Democrats and Eric supporters that we had identified mapped onto the streets of St. Cloud so that we could zoom in and say, where are the busiest streets? Where are we gonna get the most bang for our buck? Signs are expensive. We only have so much volunteer capacity to call all these people and ask them to host. Where should we actually be focusing those efforts? So maps like this, um, we would not have had access to uh, without the Blue Bonnet team, but it really made um, our efforts so much more efficient. Uh, you can actually see the guy in the upper right there crouching on the ground. That's Jim. He was the one in charge of making all the phone calls that they identified for us. Yeah. yeah. And I think that builds kind of is a good segue into kind of our other bucket of work, which is the universe creation and our targeting. So these, you know, glorious looking Excel spreadsheets that you see here in the corner of the screen uh, were a really interesting project for us from a technical perspective, um, but I think we're also hopefully valuable to the campaign. So basically what we did was, you know, there were certain key populations that the campaign wanted to reach out to. Maybe they were going after an education initiative or they felt the teachers were going to be their supporters in terms of donors and voters. Um, so we first scraped the web. You know, I remember personally going on to the school directories of the public schools in the Senate district, you know, scraping that data in an automated fashion and then cross-referencing it via names with our van. So now we knew all the teachers in the district, we could reach out to teachers specifically. We did the same for medical professionals. We did the same for veterans. And we did the same for Fisher people, I think is the correct term, sportsmen and women. Um, Fisher people. Yes. So um, <laughs> we were able to reach out to these populations in a very targeted and, you know, as Bree was talking about, make the best use of our, our time and resources. I think the other project that goes in a similar vein is our ballot chasing project. Um, and this this race came down to, I think it was about 300 votes. Um, 316. We, okay, yeah, <laughs> right under the wire there. Um, and so what we did was we obtained a list from the Secretary of State of Minnesota of all the folks who had requested absentee ballots. We cross-referenced those with strong supporters in our van and the campaign and the volunteers on the ground were able to ballot chase and call those folks who they knew had requested an absentee ballot, knew were strong supporters and make sure that they, um, you know, send their ballots in. And in a race this close, you know, in the end game there, um, we hope that that was, you know, a factor in, in bringing things over the finish line. Yeah, and I think Bree and Eric, this might be a good situation to kind of bring up the sort of wrench in the whole thing that I think really makes the ballot chase effort just so much more important to, to the ultimate success of the campaign. Yeah, uh, you, but uh, you, what do you what do you mean in like in terms By, of uh, the the third party candidate? Oh, that's right. So I, I neglected to mention which, it. There was a which third. wrench, Aiden? There are too many <laughs> wrenches. Which one do you mean? Quite the toolbox. Quite the toolbox. <laughs> Yeah, this particular wrench was uh, kind of a mess. So we, uh, the, we're all friends here, right? So I can get a little partisan for a second. Um, the Minnesota GOP has had a tradition of uh, manufacturing third-party candidates in close races. Um, in fact, uh, in our congressional race, just recently one against Angie Craig in CD2, there is an audio uh, voicemail of a candidate actually being told he was paid $15,000 to run uh, by the Minnesota Republican Party. Um, uh, as a candidate for the Legal Marijuana Now Party. So we had one of those candidates in our race who ended up getting 8% of the vote. 
uh, which was really uncool. Um, not something that we were anticipating. Uh, and a huge complication. In the prior year in 2016, uh, uh, they'd run a uh, Muslim college student as a libertarian, uh, as a way of pulling college student votes out of the race. But in that race, that third party candidate only got 2000 votes. Um, ours got something like four. So it was a real big problem for us to deal with. Um, that and COVID obviously too. And, and um, uh, obviously, uh, we all hope to never go through an election with the kinds of complications that COVID presented us with. But I need to say that without Aiden and Shea, what was incredibly difficult would have been impossible. Because when your time is so limited and your access is so limited, you have to be much more focused. But this is really important to me because it's not just strategic or tactical. It's also about understanding your district better and making better relationships. Um, you know, it, it, one of the things that uh, NHA did, we talked about the veterans list. Um, that really gave us an opportunity to have one friend of mine who's a veteran write a letter to 10 other people but that was good and that was worth something because those 10 veterans felt cared about and knew that I kind of understood something about where they were coming from. You know, um, we talked about the Fisher people. Um, that was actually a plea from uh, Joe uh, uh, Biden. I think it's Joe Biden, I think is his name. Uh, his campaign <laughs> called us and said that they wanted to reach out uh, to people who were sportsmen, uh, sportsmen and women in our district. And we said, oh, you know what? Our pals, Aiden and Shea, can totally take care of this for you. So not only did they give us access to a new community for us to reach out to, they helped us suck up, I mean, coordinate with other campaigns. Yeah. And I think one other project that is worth mentioning that we didn't get to touch on yet um, was the language mapping. Um, and so Eric mentioned that this district is incredibly diverse and rapidly changing. It's very dynamic. Um, so similarly to these other cross-referencing voter universe projects, um, David, one of our teammates, um, you know, found some data set online. I think it was some subset of census data um, and broke this down in cross-referencing with our van so that the campaign could make tailored phone calls in these um, different languages. And that's, again, another example of getting in touch with these different populations, building connections in the community um, that we were able to do with relatively like simple, you know, technical techniques, but hopefully, you know, had an impact on the campaign as well. This yeah. in particular was super impressive and super helpful work because what we got to do is we pulled all of our data from the van um, that had language barrier as a result from one of our phone calls. And so we built that list and said, these are all the folks that we had a language barrier with. And then David matched that with all the language work he had been doing and was able to give us a like uh, person, likely language based in the precinct. And then um, also did some layering in to say like, and uh, but this one's probably not the right language. You should yeah. take a look at that. So we had like a human element and a check in it. So we weren't just like making demographic calls, um, but it was really, really helpful. And we did this closer to the end of the campaign. So we could be making those calls once early voting had opened um, and help people actually get to the polls uh, with those calls. So it's a huge, huge tool. David is, is David here? He's the best. I miss him too. No, uh, sadly not. I, I stepped in his place. Major downgrade, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> he, he had something come up, so I, I stepped in. But, uh, but yeah, I think that speaks to so much. So much of the so much of the work that we did was really just to supplement the already amazing work that your really core team of volunteers is doing. Like my yard map sign wouldn't have meant anything without you know Jim going and carting those signs all over God's green yeah. earth. And I think that's like the COVID element, you know, us being virtual and the work on the ground really went both ways. Because for me, like I am a person who likes setting the pavement, you know, going up to New Hampshire from Cambridge for canvassing every year. You know, I'm really involved in politics here at MIT and COVID like sapped me of that. I wasn't able to like go out and do the campaigning that I wanted to do in this really important election. And Blue Bonnet gave me the chance to, you know, use my technical skills to do the work that I wanted to do um, in this really important and interesting race, you know, not something that I would have been exposed to, you know, here in New England. Yeah, amazing, amazing note 
to, I think, conclude the Putnam section on, um, I think what I draw from this and what I hope everybody in the audience has drawn from this is that at the end of the day, the data work and the human interaction is really entwined. Like these campaigns that are doing great work supporting people during COVID, um, you know, networking with veterans, that that is is being supported by the data. And, you know, I, I think this this drives home what this kind of work can mean in the context of knocking doors and calling phones and writing postcards. Um, thank you so much, Senator Putnam, Bree, Seamus, Aiden. Um, amazing stuff. Thank you for sharing a little bit of what you've done. And um, if I can be bold enough, I would love to um, take a, a second to explain a little bit more about what Blue Bonnet is and what we do, um, because I, I did give us very much time to explain that at the beginning. Uh, but what Blue Bonnet does is we find uh, people like Aiden, like Shay, like Nick and Miranda with really great technical and data skills. And we bring them into the political fold, um, provide training, provide resources, and then connect them with campaigns like Eric Putnam's and like Chloe Maxman's across the country that are running really, really great campaigns, talking to people on the ground in down ballot districts um, and provide them with this meaningful data support that can turn into these uh, additional contacts to this uh, support for people on the ground during crises. In 2020, Blue Bonnet worked with over 300 campaigns, trained over 500 uh, data volunteers uh, through our fellowship program. And looking forward to 2022, we hope to do the same thing. Uh, I hope some of these stories today have shown you what kind of effect that's capable of and what we are trying to achieve here. Uh, but as promised, I do want to go ahead and get on to the uh, question and answer section. So I, I noticed that a ton of questions have been popped into the chat. Uh, any co-hosts, uh, feel free to, to pop in and suggest questions. Um, I did, to start things off, I did want to pose one question that I thought was really good, which is uh, the learning curve for a Blue Bonnet Data Fellow. So I think Aiden or Miranda, if y'all could talk a little bit about what it's like to come into politics and start doing this data work. Miranda, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, so I trained formally in economics and data science. Um, I've done like research mainly in like financial economics and just like economic topics. So never really like done anything that had to do with campaigns or political science. So it was really cool to like think about questions that I never thought about before. Like how do we measure um, the possibility of this district uh, flipping into our side? Uh, and just like how, how do we look at the trend in a more, um, in a way that we can actually implement because the other things I was doing didn't really like require actions afterwards. You know, it, it's, it's more just like, oh, there, there is a causal relationship between the price and the supply, like, so, something like that. So that was really cool to like actually do something that um, create like tangible impact. Um, and I guess there was a bit of learning curve because there were some new plots I never really made before. So I like learned the code for that. Um, just like being able to um, being able to translate the needs of the um, campaign into uh, actions um, for our team, just because like sometimes if you're working with people um, who didn't like code, you, you have to like figure out what they're asking and how to actually figure out um, how to solve that problem in like tangible steps. So that was really cool as well. Yeah, I definitely second a lot of what Miranda just said. I also was coming from a very like theoretical statistics background. Um, my only prior work experience had been in finance, um, but I really wanted to channel all that energy into something that I thought would be a bit more um, instantly positive. And a lot of the real gratification came from like Miranda was saying, finally having like some results from your analysis. It's no longer just like me sending a piece set to my professor. It's like someone's actually going to try and use what I just said to accomplish something out in the world. Um, and that was really exciting. But yeah, like, like Miranda said, I think there was a, a bit of a steep learning curve for me personally from the political side of things, having 
you know, I wasn't a seasoned campaign operative like my older brother who, you know, was knocking doors every weekend and working with uh, uh, city council candidates in Cambridge. I was, you know, I had maybe gone phone banking once or Canvas once prior to this. Um, and so a lot of it was just kind of learning how a campaign operates, like what are the realistic goals and expectations of any campaign? You know, what are, what are the resources that a campaign is working with? Um, and then too, I think the steep learning curve, like I talked about earlier, was just trying to understand the district. What is the context that I, as someone from halfway across the country, am entering into? And what does that mean for the work that I do and how I should be sensitive about different subjects or be aware of different um, trends or, or issues in the area and how that can kind of change the way that you're thinking about a particular problem or, or um, about a particular analysis. So that was definitely the steepest learning curve for, for me personally. Paul, I have a question for um, both the, the campaign managers as well as the Blue Bonnet Fellows. I think it's a two-part question um, around how did the team select the topics to analyze? And then can you provide a, an example of such data that led the teams to prioritize certain areas or certain um, demographic groups? And maybe, um, uh, yeah, like maybe Canyon and Miranda and Nick, if you wanna, um, just so we can go back and forth between the campaigns, if you guys wanna start, and then we can go over to Bree and Shay and Aiden. Cool, I'd be happy to, happy to start her off. Um, one of the things that we were really trying to hone in on was, so like I mentioned, the pit, Lincoln County is a pivot county, which means it went twice for Obama, and then it went for Trump. So, um, so we were trying to figure out, you know, where, where are the places, where are the precincts where we're seeing um, a lot of, a lot of variability where those, those voters might be most likely to be kind of the, the Democratic drop off, maybe, maybe folks who are, who are still registered as Democrats, but, but who have um, drifted away from the Democratic Party over recent years. Um, and so I'd go through the, the visualizations they made for each precinct um, and kind of annotate the areas where I saw pretty stark differences um, either from year to year or, or also between candidates. Like, um, you know, did they, did they vote overwhelmingly for for Susan Collins, the, the Republican for for U.S. Senate, but um, but also go blue at you know at uh, a congressional level, um, and so that that kind of allowed us to to figure out where to prioritize our our volunteer and, and candidate time on the doors. Yeah, and just um, in general, I think, uh, you know, as we, we all our volunteers have said, you know, we're all trained in, to solve problem sets in school. So when we have a problem, we can solve it. I think the most difficult part uh, for us to learn is to figure out what actually to analyze. Um, and that comes from, you know, this getting to know the district and frequently meeting with the campaign teams. Like uh, we're meeting with Canyon uh, basically every week and we'd, talk to him and, and, you know, he would sometimes give us ideas or we'd come and say, would it make sense for us to analyze these two things? Sometimes, you know, he'd say, no, we don't need that. Or like, yes, but can you try this? I mean, it, that, that's part of the ongoing conversation why we talk to each other so frequently is because that's sort of the art of the whole thing is to figure out um, what should be analyzed, what's useful. Thank you. Um... Would love to get your thoughts on, on this question. Um, what's the best way, or how did you find the best way to make a difference in a local election um, that is happening simultaneously with a presidential election that was as polarized and personal um, as this one was, um, when there's so many people who are just voting right down the ballot? 
I think we can take this because I think this was sort of our campaign's whole philosophy was to make the politics as personal as we could. We didn't run as Eric the Democrat. We didn't run as Eric also on the ticket with Biden. He was running as Eric and we called him Eric the whole time. He was never Mr. Putnam. Um, oh God, he was he was not even that when he was my college professor like 15 years ago. Like he's <laughs> just, um, I think that when we think about the best ways to kind of differentiate yourself among all the noise is to run a race that does feel personal. And that's what we did with all the data we had. So when we're thinking about picking projects that will help the politics feel personal, that was what it was all about for us is what could the Blue Bonnet data team do? And then how could we creatively use that in a way that made politics feel as personal as it really is? So ignoring all the noise, ignoring who you're on the ballot with, except for in your messaging when you can sort of do it via implication, um, that was sort of how we differentiated ourselves and made it so Eric wasn't just your regular standard Democrat that half the people, like more than half the people in town are not gonna wanna vote for. You know, and I would, I would sort of extend that too in some ways and say that, you know, as, as to your, your prior question too, Rachel, and that we would meet every week and say, what do we want to learn about where we live? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I think something that's missing from politics these days is curiosity. And the work that we did with Blue Bonnet made me not just a better candidate, it's made me a better senator because I know more about my community. And you can knock every door and you can see every house as you're walking down the street and you can not know what's going on behind those doors. And you cannot know trends in the ways that people are behaving, the things that people are striving with behind those doors. And that's why working with Blue Bonnet was so wonderful. Um, exactly as Paul suggested before, is that they come together. But I think in terms of this question specifically, how do you win a race? Is you do the, the, to me, the currency of politics these days, one of the lessons we have learned from Trump is that the currency of politics is authenticity. Today's politics are, are about not just building personal relationships, but actually freaking meaning it. To me, that's like, that's the big difference. Um, and that's something you can do in a local race that you can't do if you're running higher up. If you're trying to get 300,000 votes instead of just 20,000, even though 20,000 is a pretty damn big number, um, you still can actually make genuine relationships, not manufactured genuine relationships, but you can actually really listen to people. I, I love that answer because what you're saying is the data isn't just to win the election, but it's also um, useful. It's also the data to you know, represent your, your district um, in office. Um, so let me try another, let me try another question. There's so many good questions that are coming in. Um, what, you know, we know that analysis is only as good as the data that supports it. So what kinds of data, and I, I love the example, Shay, that you provided around um, scraping the education data and reapplying it or the language data. Um, but what kinds of data, and this is really for the Blue Bonnet teams, um, do you think are missing and are particularly useful? And is there a way for the campaigns to really help um, have their volunteers really help provide data or build out data sets in, you, in, in new ways? Yeah, well, I can speak to that. And I'm also very curious to hear what the other fellows have to say. I think that our strategy was oftentimes to like start with the publicly available data um, because there's a lot of that out there, like the census, the American Community Survey and things below that. Um, that's where we got all that information on small businesses, manufacturing trends. And then, you know, when there's data that's not already gathered and curated by the government for you, you have to get a little bit more creative. And that's where our web scraping came in, you know, for the teachers, we were lucky that um, all the districts had a public directory so we could just write a script and grab all their names off the internet. Beyond that, we had to get a little bit more creative. Like for the veterans, we went to you know public museum directories where they had memorials to veterans in the area. We went to Facebook pages and scraped the names of the people who had liked the Facebook pages. Um, so, it was an interesting challenge for us to be like, you know, we want to find, we want to target these people. How do we find them um, on the internet? And so that was interesting for us. So I would say we worked our way down from the census um, and then got creative from there. Yeah, and I would say to, to your question, Rachel, that like, I don't think there's any data sets that don't exist or aren't already being curated, but I think the real, issue and challenge that a lot of our public data collection was trying to get around was 
the kind of lack of quality data in a lot of the voter file softwares that campaigns are working with. That a lot of the tags of whether someone's a strong Democrat or not, or whether someone's gonna have a language barrier or not, or what their uh, kind of affinity groups might be is often very incomplete. You know, when we went in and were trying to calculate the win numbers by precincts, um, I think over half of the voters in Van did not have a likely party indicator. They were no data points or unknown. And so if you're working with only really 50% of a data set, it's not the most useful data set. Um, and so I think the, the biggest challenge that teams and campaigns really need to look towards as they continue cycle after cycle is really kind of improving the institutional memory of democratic campaigning and improving data collection when we are hitting the pavement or making calls or sending texts and really doing our best to collect the data that we can when we can. And I think that was a, a really big challenge that a lot of our public data collection was trying to kind of skirt around. Thanks. Um, Miranda and Nick, um, do you want to comment on that as well? Uh, I, I don't have anything to add. I think that's a very good answer. Yeah, uh, I, I second that. I definitely think we didn't really use web scraping. That's something that we can like probably think about using in the future as well. Um, I guess like one more thing is just like in terms of like the COVID stuff we did, we used a bunch of um, tools online that was already really helpful in terms of like mapping people. So that was just like something we look into as well. So like it's a very, very easy to use so people can like look into that. Like Google um, map has some options for food banking and stuff like that. So then a few questions that have come in about the organization and the structure of the Blue Bonnet teams and how you worked within each other as well as partnering with a campaign. Um, can some of the fellows talk about how you divided responsibilities across your team and whether there was an appointed leader? Yeah, I can speak to our team structure, which was very fluid. You know, we tried to shuffle roles and this is something that Blue Bonnet actually encourages the teams to do, you know, have a meeting leader every week, have a note taker every week. And then I think we basically just split up um, our projects by technical aptitude or interest. Um, you know, we all had very similar skill sets, but, you know, Aiden had more GIS and mapping experience than us. So he put together the maps and we had people who were more familiar with web scraping or trend analysis. Um, but I think a key part of the team structure was actually our weekly meetings with the campaign. Um, those were absolutely crucial um, to getting our work done, you know, in terms of sanity checking our analyses, like, does this look right? Um, also just getting our, our marching orders and figuring out what was important. And we were really, really lucky that every week we got to have a real dialogue with both uh, Bree, our campaign manager and our candidate, Eric. And that was like essential to our success um, because we wouldn't have been nearly as effective uh, otherwise. So I, I wanna hear more answers to that question, but I think you hit on something that um, you know just resonated with me. Did you ever bring data to the campaign and the campaign says, wait a second, that just doesn't jive? I think that was something that was interesting about some of those um, trend analyses that we were seeing. Like when you're looking at wage data, you know, you have to have, you know, contextual factors about the district in mind that we may, we may not be thinking about. You know, we download all these spreadsheets from the census data and we plot some things. Well, then we chat with the campaign like is that really the metric that we're looking for like is this really the most accurate indicator of people's quality of life or the problems that they're facing and making sure that like the data is actually communicating something effective as with respect to the context i don't know if you want to add to that eh? no I, I think that that's exactly it and i think with that's something that we did run into especially with the business analysis because there were so many different data sets and ways to look at things and as some of the charts from shay showed there was kind of a decline in the number of establishments and so we kind of interpret that as a team as oh there are jobs disappearing here but i think that's something that the campaign was able to kind of correct us on when we were able to have that weekly meeting and say no it's not so much that people are losing their jobs it's that 
big uh, food manufacturing companies are kind of consolidating power in this part of Minnesota. And that's a, also was a great way to kind of tie it into some of the other analyses we had done and understanding that, you know, that's a big uh, source of jobs for the immigrant and refugee community in the, in the city of these kind of jobs that are at these plants outside of the city and understanding how that intersects with both their quality of life and the wages that we were seeing. And so that was definitely a situation where we saw kind of a, a slight disconnect between what we would assume and what the campaign actually knew intuitively about their district. I'll also say our district has three counties. It, um, so if you're just looking on a map at District 14, you have to pull data for three different counties, but there's only like a sliver of one of those counties in our district. And so kind of navigating some of that um, early on to just know that county level data was not necessarily gonna be the best indicator of conditions in St. Cloud proper. And Canyon, thank, thank you so much. Um, Canyon, Miranda, Nick, any corollaries on your, on, on your side? None really off the top of my head. Nick and Miranda, if you do. So let me um, let me close with this question. Did you really knock on all doors? Uh, you know, at at a state house or a state senate race, if you've if you've got a crazy volunteer network, maybe, but I wouldn't recommend it. Um, you know, that's that's a big part of where where data comes in you know you don't you don't need to knock on on my my door and tell me to go out and vote for Dana Dow you know um you want to really concentrate the candidate's time the volunteer's time where it's going to be most effective and um and so so that generally doesn't look like having conversations with you know the most hardcore um conservatives or the most hardcore liberals it's um it's it's honing in on some slice of the middle or figuring out where you know where there might be an in more at the margins of of the side that you're that you're going after um and so yeah <laughs> don't recommend um you know if you're if you're short on time and short on resources as we always are in an election campaign, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> How about in St. Cloud in the vicinity? Well, so uh, we've heard that there's research that documents that you're not supposed to knock hard opposition votes because that motivates them to come out and vote against you. I don't know if that's true or not, um, but I do know that we didn't knock a single door in 2020 because of COVID. So, um, you know, our theory has always been that that at least my approach uh, has always been that you, you're in through respect and trust and you don't know what's going on behind someone's door uh, if they're sick or not sick and um, it's better just to do no harm. So my opponent knocked doors and actually um, ended up dying of COVID a month after the election. Uh, he caught COVID at a Republican victory party uh, the day after the election and passed away a month later. Um, but he was a good guy, so it's not really cool, and it's tragic and awful, but we chose not to knock a single door um, this, this particular election, just for the reason that I'm just suggesting. I, the, the idea of knocking on someone's door and having them not just be upset, but actually be concerned about their own health is something I didn't even want to mess with. Yeah. It was an extraordinary year, um, and so many lessons learned, and some things that we'll really look forward to returning to old ways, but I think that there have been a number of lessons that we'll incorporate into future ele elections because there were a lot of innovations and troubleshooting examples that led to some great innovations. Um, I wanna thank you all for participating tonight um, and I wanted to hand it back to, to Paul. Thank you so much, Rachel. Uh, thank you even more to everybody who uh, joined us from these two amazing campaigns. Uh, you know, huge claps in the chat. I, I really appreciate all of you for taking the time and energy to share your stories. Um, this is just a taste of what happened in 2020 across thousands of down ballot races, hundreds of down ballot races that Blue Bonnet was working with. 
and it is hopefully a taste of some of the success that we are going to see looking forward to 2022. Obviously, we are in extraordinary times. Uh, these down ballot candidates are what I believe are driving the success that we see uh, in our party. Um, and it relies on a lot of different ingredients, great candidates, great staff, super volunteers. And of course, uh, we can't forget the data teams. So thank you everybody for, for joining us. It's been a wonderful call and a pleasure to share a little bit of what we've been up to with you. Uh, if anybody has any, any questions, uh, I believe they can follow up with us. Becca, can you pop our emails in the chat? Um, feel free to follow up with us uh, or check out the Blue Bonnet website. Um, but other than that, I hope everybody has a great rest of their Sunday.